Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listener. I'm in all of your ears, whether it's one, two, or more. Thanks to all of you, including Hector Bones, Dan Crafton, Tim Ashman, and Gordon Edwards. On this episode of DTNS, X makes likes private. That sounds like something else, but X has made likes private. Uh, Wacom uses a blockchain to protect artists from AI, and Scott Johnson reports in on the iPad M4. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, June 12th, 2024 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. In Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chen. <laughs> X makes like private. It's like a 40s movie, you know? <laughs> Ooh, yeah, that doesn't sound good. No, <laughs> it doesn't. Uh, and, and a lot of people don't think it sounds good. We're going to discuss that and more. Let's start with the quick hits. YouTube is rolling out a new thumbnail testing feature to creators called Thumbnail Test and Compare in the coming weeks. The idea is that creators can upload two thumbnails for a single video and then test them evenly across their viewership. Those thumbnails being tested will appear for different users with stats going back to the creator on how long the thumbnail influenced, how many people watched a video, how long they watched, and more. After a few days, YouTube will determine a winner if engagement's results are clear or just recommend a preferred choice for the creator to decide for themselves. Uh, speaking of air quotes, Waymo issued a recall of its software after one of its unoccupied vehicles hit a telephone pole at eight miles an hour in Phoenix last month. The recall just means it has alerted the U.S. NHTSA that its 672 cars have been updated to correct for the issue. So they, they disclose all the software updates, why they did it, and all that sort of thing. Uh, vehicle hit a pole in an alley. That alley had nothing but a yellow line to mark where a line of telephone poles were, and those poles were level with the road. They weren't like up on a curb. The software treated it as a low damage situation, so the software update has upgraded that. Waymo has issued one previous recall in February. You may remember that one. Uh, two of its vehicles inaccurately predicted the movement of a towed vehicle in that case. I got to tell you, uh, after uh, I think a few weeks ago when I said that I saw my first Waymo vehicle in my neighborhood, my neighborhood is clearly part of a new Waymo test. It's like every five cars. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. It's nice. crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Waymo. Waymo. Welcome Waymo, to Arlington Waymos. Heights. Uh, <laughs> st Stable Diffusion Medium is the latest release from Stability AI intended to be a smaller model that can run on consumer-grade GPUs. Medium is designed to make Stable Diffusion 3 an even better option for users or organizations with resource constraints. Stable Diffusion Medium available today for users to try out through Stability AI's API and the Stable Artisan service on Discord. The model weights will also be available for non-commercial use on Hugging Face. Ex-CEO Elon Musk, he's the current CEO of a company called X, withdrew <laughs> his lawsuit against OpenAI. Uh, he had sued OpenAI and two of the company's co-founders, Sam Altman and Greg Brockman. The judge was about to hear OpenAI's request for dismissal on Wednesday, but he has withdrawn the suit before that. This is the one over breach of contract, uh, even though there was no formal contract. So it wasn't entirely ridiculous, but it was a stretch. Uh, meanwhile, the billionaires carried out their spat in the court of public opinion. Musk called iOS 18 a security violation for including ChatGPT integration. And at a Fortune-sponsored event, OpenAI CTO Mira Mirati said, well, that's his opinion. 404 Media reports that an attacker broke into systems used by tracking company Tile, including a tool that processes lo location data requests for law enforcement and stole a large amount of customer data, such as names, physical addresses, email addresses, and phone numbers, according to samples of the data and screenshots of the tools that was seen by 404 Media. The data doesn't include location of tile devices themselves, though, and that would be, that would be the big one. 
The attacker does tell 404 Media they demanded payment from Tile before the breach became public, but did not receive a response. Yeah, please help spread understanding by letting your friends and relatives know it was not the location data because everybody's going to see this headline and be like, oh, they stole the location. Yeah, I mean, they not know that it's that great. I went to the hospital. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's not great to have name, physical address, email address, phone number, but also, sadly, those are probably already out there from other breaches in a lot of cases. So, you know, yeah. you know, how that indeed. Goes. All right, so let's talk about X. X, the social network, used to be called Twitter. We all know it as X now. X announced in a post from its official engineering account that this week it will no longer be offering who liked a post on the platform to be public information. So if I post something, I say, I like cheese. I, as the poster, can see who liked my post. Tom may have liked the post. He likes the post, I like cheese. I see it, and Tom, as somebody who liked the post, also has that in his records of liked likes. Scott, though, cannot see that Tom liked my post saying I like cheese. He can see that there is a like, and maybe lots of other people liked it. Maybe there are 300 likes on this post. But he doesn't know that Tom now has liked my post. Hopefully that makes sense. CEO Elon Musk says this change is in an effort to let people like posts without getting attacked for doing so. Okay, not every post is all that political. Me liking cheese doesn't seem to, you know, be a needle mover all that much to me, but you never know. X originally launched this feature to hide the likes tab for X premium subscribers last year. So there are some people out there being like, well, we could already do this. You could do that as a premium subscriber. For uh, people on free accounts, you couldn't. Um, but I wanted to I wanted to pull the group on how we feel about this because I cannot think of really any situation where I would like something and not want the world to know that I liked it. I mean, I think this is cases like it's. A First of all, it's easy for anybody to hear about any of these changes, as we've alluded to, and go conspiracy, or it's there's this reason or that reason, or apply other reasons to it. We don't know where this came from in the company. We don't know who's asking for it. Uh, but we do know that they're going to implement it. Here's who I think this works for. If you are somebody who, let's say you're in a high political office. I'm not going to use any names. But let's say that's who you are. And you you like a post that maybe is a little salacious. Perhaps <laughs> pornographic. I don't know. <laughs> and you like it with a with a big heart. Boop, you hit it. And you maybe yeah. and maybe you didn't even mean to. Maybe it just you know, whoops, i I guess I did click that or whatever. And this has happened before in a couple of notable situations. Sure. Um those people will obviously benefit from nobody knowing that they liked a thing except for the people that liked it. And I suppose they could still expose that and make noise about it given the status of the person. Um but I think this cuts down on Maybe accidental likes, um, that sort of thing. But I'm I'm with you in spirit in the idea that I cannot think of a situation where it would matter to me. I guess it's still it's still good that we have the currency of likes as a thing I can see totals of, and we also have it as a way for the people who got the like to know that they got liked by you. Like yeah. the transactional nature of the likes is still sort of there. It's just we're not giving strangers the same access they used to have to, to those so individual much likes. There's context when it comes to, I mean, social networks in general, but, you know, the old days of Twitter, if I, you know, going back to, like, I like cheese, like, that's a dumb tweet, right? That means nothing. But what if it means something? Who liked my tweet, that is contextual information. You know, if Tom and Joe Biden and, you know, I don't know, the Dalai Lama, like, all like the tweet, it's like, Ooh, what did she mean? Mm, let's, you know, let's get more into what, you know, Sarah's talking about here. For that tweet to get, you know, three likes, I mean, as it should, if not zero, that would be normal. But what if it got 4,000? You'd be like, what's going on here? But I don't know. I don't know who's behind what, you know, the, the sort of amplification, I think, of, of whatever I'm saying. Whatever the yeah. statement is, is almost, you know, irrelevant. It's the amplification, I think, that um, has a lot of people's, uh, you know, kind of scratching their heads. I don't see why there's any problem with this. First of all, they're taking a paid service and making it free, which is what everybody always wants them to do. Uh, and second of all, uh, when's the last time any of you on any platform 
looked at who liked a post that wasn't yours? Uh, I mean, it's well, been a while. If they're I big mean, public ones, like, I don't know. Sarah's, so I think Sarah has a point I, to like, is this I get just it, bots? That, is this, I, like, I definitely do that with my own stuff. Sometimes sure, and, I do that, it. and they're not they're not taking that away. Do you can still something... see it with your own stuff. Right. Right, right. But you know, if you were I and I guess I see your point, uh, Tom, is you know, it would be controversial, right? Because a conf- uh, something that I consider controversial, I'd be like, who likes this? Like, you know, like you know, you know, where are people what side are they on kind of thing. And There's that, plenty... you know, that that may be a great reason to just sort of decimate that. There's plenty of other ways to detect bots. Uh, that is the one legitimate thing I can see is like, oh, if this got 4,000 likes, if I can see who liked it, I would be able to tell if a lot of them look like bots maybe. Uh, but again, I don't think most users are, are doing that either. And there's other ways to prevent that. The platform should prevent that. Uh, and there are lots of examples of, you know, forget the porn example that Scott used. Uh, you know, there's, there's a product that's been boycotted. And I am either less aware of that or forgot and like a post from that brand and a bunch of people come at me uh, because I liked that post. It's a chilling effect and it's going to make people like stuff less. This will allow people to be like, you know what, I can like what I like and only the person I'm liking is going to see it and I don't have to worry about it. I also don't think that was a huge problem. Okay, fine. This let's I, I think maybe we can all agree that in this case, X is a teapot. Uh, or a teacup, and this is a tempest. That's inside of it. a little bit. It's a little bit. I, it feels like a thing that yeah. teacup. Mm-hmm. Teacup. One, whenever you take something or seem to be taking something away, people just lose their minds, and I don't know how you avoid that. But, well, and uh, then there's yeah. a multiplier effect of people who want to not like X, and so they're going to try. Well, to and that, that you know that uh, I think that's what a lot of this ha- has to do with is just sort of like. You're just ruining this thing that I used to like, yeah. and it has further become different than the thing that I originally liked. Because I'm, I'm, I'm with I'm, you. Like, I'm in I've, that camp. I've never minded people seeing what I like, but that's also like, well, if you have nothing to hide, then you don't have to worry about it. So I also don't mind that they're taking that away. It's not really a big deal either way for me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, I I've never liked something and been like. But if the wrong person sees that I liked it, it's curtains well, for me. Well, I, it's I like, don't just think don't most people. Like it, then. I, I don't think most people think that. I think they like something and then they then people come after them. That happens a lot. Yeah. Right. And thankfully, yeah, it hasn't they don't happened realize to me. Either, so. how yeah. Uh, let's talk about a use for blockchain. Hold on, hold on. It's not NFTs. <laughs> just, just, just bear with me. Uh, <laughs> I know I'm naive, but I keep thinking there might be another use that isn't a fraud for blockchain. And uh, Wacom, the tablet makers, have come up with an, a candidate for this. Wacom UFI spelled Y-U-I-F-Y, is in beta testing with Adobe. It's a service that lets artists record ownership of their work on a blockchain that therefore is very difficult to change, if, if not almost impossible to change. Uh, and that lets them control use of their images because there's an indelible record of their ownership. Uh, the idea would be that you make your image in compatible software, say Photoshop, since Adobe's working with them. You export it as a JPEG or a PNG to UFI. UFI adds a micro mark a few non-destructive pixels to the image, and that micro mark is linked to a record on the UFI blockchain. Artists can then use a license builder tool to use UFI to control the terms of use for the image. So they can say, anybody can use this, or they can say, oh, no, you got to pay a license fee, and then the blockchain will allow you to use it legally. Uh, Again, this is not a measure to prevent piracy. You can rip those pixels out. There would be lots of ways to do it. It's not trying to be DRM. It's trying to show ownership and also authorship. If you're concerned about whether something is made by a human or not, this will help you determine, oh, it really was made by a human. Uh, Wacom UFI is available as a plugin for Photoshop. A beta version is coming shortly to Rebel 7 and Clip Paint Studio will get it at the end of June. And you do not need to use a Wacom tablet uh, to take advantage of it. Uh, Scott, if anybody doesn't know, Scott's an artist. Do you think you would find this useful? Um, It's a step in the right direction. I actually really like that it's coming from Wacom. Uh, For those that say Wacom, it's okay. They forgive you. It doesn't matter, honestly. But here's the thing. Uh, 
this is a step in the right direction. The idea that this plugin will be available for pl flagship products like Photoshop makes sense at first, uh, but soon after other, uh, other platforms, other software, other apps, that sort of thing, that all makes sense too. Um, and I think it's cool they're spearheading it. And it actually really represents, I think, a legitimate use case for this technology and should help artists in general. However, I don't know that it's entirely enough um, as it stands right now, I could go to an, any image search, find somebody's art, download it, and then upload it again to this uh, plugin and claim ownership on the blockchain. I think that's dangerous. It could work itself out over time because if enough images have the ownership, then you can't just simply pull down somebody else's image and do it. And like you said, Tom, there are ways around it, but that's why I see this as a step, a very good step, but a step nonetheless in the right direction, maybe not the full solution. There may never be a full solution uh, to this because we were talking about bits and pickle, pixels, not pickles, there's no pickles at all. <laughs> bits and pickles, uh, <laughs> delicious. <laughs> um, and as a result, there's so much that can be faked, remade, redone, uh, fooled, that sort of thing. And um, time will tell whether we come up with technologies to better uh, control all of that, but like I say, it's good. Artists need better, uh, better options in this direction. This is a start, at least. And if it if it if it does anything, I think it'll spawn a bunch of plugins, and maybe other plugins will have some other cool ideas that they're not thinking of. Like it's it's a it's a good move. It is not a move that can, that's going to cost you money. You're not going to pay Wacom for this. You don't even have to buy their tablet. And it's also just good PR for them because they've kind of slipped in recent years in terms of usership. There's a lot of you know, Surface Pros and iPad Pros and various other tablets from China that are very competitive, faster, those sorts of things. And, and Wacom slipped a bit in market share. To have this, you know, have their name on this and be pushing for this is really good. I don't know, good PR for, yeah. for them how, with artists. How do you and I think feel about wa Wacom, uh, Wacom, whatever, however you like to say it? At this point, sure. uh, Scott, knowing that there are other alternatives, I mean, is that still the industry standard? I mean, in a lot of ways, yes. When you when we say industry, it kind of depends on what you're talking about. But if you're looking at, like, let's say, an animation studio in uh, Japan who is or Korea that's doing a bunch of animation for, say, The Simpsons or something, which is how those shows are made, um, those places are chock full of computers with Wacom tablets. They are the standard. But that is starting to chip away. When it comes to, like, individual artists and those who are, you know, maybe they're they're uh, you know simply doing commissions or something. There is definitely a pull away from the very expensive hardware that you can buy from Wacom and moving on to other things that are less expensive, a little more accessible, that sort of thing. iPad Pros being the biggest culprit in this regard. Um, all of that being said, though, I think it does them more good than bad to get out ahead of some of these other things that have nothing to do with sales of their device. It's more about, hey, we're in this community. We're part of this. We're intrinsic to it. Wouldn't it be cool if artists could have better control over their own work? Here's a start at trying to do that. And I, I, I think that's great that they did it. Well, folks, uh, there's lots of way to get your tech news. Uh, we like that you use this way, Daily Tech News Show, as a podcast. But I know some of you also like to read a little bit of a newsletter. Uh, there's a bunch of them out there. Maybe you should try mine. If you like my perspective on tech news and you'd like more of it, it can land in your inbox every morning. I've made a free preview of my tech newsletter for subscribers all this week week. Usually everybody gets it free on Thursday. This week, everybody gets it free every day. Uh, today, there's a story about a man who is running for mayor of Cheyenne, Wyoming as a chatbot. Uh, there's also a, a big story about the Pew Research Center's survey on where people get their news on social media. If you want my takes on those, go sign up right now. Freetechnewsletter.com. Apple released the iPad Pro M4 less than a month ago now, uh, and it is the first device to have the M4 processor, the Ultra Retina XDR display. The iPad Pro M4 has the same processing power as the M2, but uses half the power, and it has a new neural engine, which delivers 38 tops, more than double what the M1 and M2 can do. Now, that's going to be handy with uh, the new iPad OS that's coming later this year. But Scott, you got your iPad Pro M4 last week, so you don't have the new versions of iOS that were announced uh, at the beginning of this week. 
What are your hands-on impressions of it so far? Well, I am looking forward to the AI stuff. I'm looking forward to getting public. Maybe even, I'll even probably try beta uh, when it's public. Currently, the dev beta it seems to be received really well on iPadOS, like very stable, very solid from what I've heard. Uh, but I don't have a dev account, so I can't do it yet. Um, when I do, definitely going to have more to say a little bit later on uh, right here on the show and, and elsewhere. But uh, here are some of my early impressions. There are big changes to this device. First of all, it's very thin. Um, it's kind of hard to tell on camera, but that is a very thin device. Really it's, hard to tell in audio, too. Yeah, that's true. You guys at home who can't see this, very thin. Um, it is. I will, uh, I will tell you yeah. it looks very thin. It is very I, thin. I second that. You stack your phone up next to it, it seems even more thin. Um, but anyway, a, it is a... A svelte tablet. <laughs> it's a very thin tablet. Uh, that is not why I got it, though. The big reasons are a number of things. Number one is the screen. I went with the micro texture upgrade on the screen, and the mm, reason I did that yeah, is... Yeah, I was um, curious about that. A couple of reasons. One is there's zero glare on this thing. I can look at it from any angle in any light, and I get no glare, and it's pretty impressive. Um, I didn't expect that to be as cool, although I will say this device gets finger smudges way more than the glass mm -hmm. ones do. Um, it's okay. That surprises yourself... me because, I mean, what's more smudgy than a glass screen? Well, it's really simple. The, 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 the micro texture is literally that, and it is a very small texture. It's very hard to perceive with your eyes, but as a result, it holds more oils, more smear, uh, more whatever. And it's actually, if you take yeah. like a wet cloth, which is what I used to do in my, my fifth gen, and try to wipe that off, it doesn't actually work. So if you use a micro cloth like one of these, you get with your glasses or any device really with a screen, these work great. No problem. It's not like you're, it's, you know, it doesn't ruin it's the experience. It's not the end of the world, but something to consider. No. Yeah, it's just something to know. But anyway, the biggest difference is that anti-glare, but also uh, the performance of the pen, the, the Pencil Pro, which I also picked up with this, you have to if you want to use a pencil, the Pro only works with the Pro, um, is not quite paper in terms of drag, but uh, much closer to that. And uh, I think this is going to make it so a lot of artists are not going to want to go out and buy the texture overlay that you can buy. You can buy these clear overlays that stick on there almost like a screen protector, and they provide more texture. The problem with those are they tend to wear the pen down so your nibs get small, depending on how much you're using it, how hard you're pushing, that sort of thing. This micro texture screen is just enough of that to give it a little bit more in the direction of paper or Bristol board and pull it away from that feeling of just drawing plastic on glass. Uh, which again is fine, but it's not the you know it doesn't feel the best, especially if you're not used to it. Um, I really like that so far. Performance-wise, on that actual aspect of it, the art, the drawing, the using the pen to create, very good. In fact, kind of blew my mind. Good. The performance I thought would feel nominally faster, and I would notice it, but I didn't expect to have it be immediately and substantially faster. Uh, with all the kind of use cases I have for it, especially drawing. Uh, exporting files take a fraction of the time that the my M2 model mm -hmm. did. Um, it is kind of I honestly I'm a little blown away by all that stuff. Everything flies now at performance load times. Anything that needs a load time, um, those are the biggest boosts. Procreate alone, which I use mostly for my art and illustration, blazing fast. And as far as I know, they've barely done any updates to this app since this thing came out to take advantage of anything. The only thing I've noticed right. is it's, it's the pen. The device if, if I, yeah, and if I hover over with the new pencil, I do get some functionality I didn't used to get. For example, if I have a grouping of, uh, the, the way they do these, almost like folders, but they're groups of art you kind of stacked on top of each other for organizational purposes. When I hover over it, they kind of fan out and I get to see them all. Um, if I want to see, if I hover over a drawing I've done, it will uh, change from just the static image to here's the replay of the art that you drew in like an animated form, which is a thing we could already export as, but now this is giving you real-time previews and it's only happening with the new, the new pencil. Um, beyond that though, in terms of that Pencil Pro, it's the least changed thing. Latency, way better. I can't tell if that's the pencil or the device being so fast mm -hmm. or a combination of the two. My guess is mm -hmm. it's the third option. I don't really know, it's hard to say. Um, the squeeze feature, which you can feel, it's like a haptic squeeze. I'm feeling it right now. I, I know you were you were sort of eh, about that squeeze feature when you first saw it announced. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now it's feel, now I'm getting actually to use it. 
this is something in like Apple Notes. They've got a way to hit that, and you can change marker size and type and you know point size and all this sort of thing. So there are use cases for this already, but in apps that I use, none of them have programmed anything in there or, or patched these to do much with it. So right now that stuff's kind of useless to me until someone shows me a way that it, that it seems awesome. I'm, I think there's a lot of potential in here, but it's not it's not showing up yet. Um, what else was I going to say? Uh, oh, uh, the battery life is way better on this pen pencil than the previous one. Way, way better. And I don't know that they even advertised that or talked about it in their presentation, but I get way more life out of this than I did before. And that's big for, you know, big, long drawing sessions and that sort of thing. So I'm very, very happy with that. All right. What do you like about it so far? What's, what's, uh, what's the biggest things? Obviously, the speed increase. That's one thing. Anything else? Yeah, I think... Um, for all the mission critical stuff like I do with Procreate, Clip Studio, which you mentioned earlier uh, with the uh, uh, the blockchain stuff, the Affinity apps, all of these perform extremely well and fast without really any major updates. Again, this is the same current version of iPad OS everybody's using, and all of that stuff is immediately faster and better. Um, the beta will really be the big test, or I guess even just the final mm -hmm. version of iOS 18 when we get a chance, or uh, iPad OS, I should say. Yeah. When we really get a chance to see what the AI stuff does, I really wish the calculator thing was in here now because that, quite frankly, was the most exciting thing they showed from their AI presentation in terms of just like, ooh, I want to fiddle with that, and I haven't had a chance, obviously. So those kinds of things are interesting to me. They're gonna, they'll are gonna they come when they come. Um, overall, I'm very happy with it. This is not a cheap device, but it is also relatively inexpensive when compared to you know the larger, more traditional yeah. Wacom's or other stuff out there. Not to throw them under the bus immediately after talking about them. <laughs> They're but, better at blockchain anyway. Yeah, and it's uh, it's also lighter. Uh, lighter is helpful when you are used to sitting with this thing for a long period of time doing a lot of work on it. Also, the, the camera bump is not nearly as thick as it was in previous uh, iterations. So there's just little things like that that are adding uh, to my good time. And I have a Magic Keyboard coming, so I'll be able to talk about that when we do a little bit longer live with it discussion. Yeah. Um, but thus far, yeah, I'm very happy with it. And um, for what I need it for, like these mission critical art apps, huge upgrade. And uh, that that part was uh, that took me back. I was afraid I was going to be like, oh well, I guess I'm getting AI. That's cool, yeah, I guess. Yeah. But this is much faster than I expected. Well, a good first take on the M4 iPad. Uh, but as Scott said, we we want him to do a live with it once he's we spend a few months on it and, and gets the beta on it and all that. Uh, maybe he'll even have played Baldur's Gate three on it by then. So patrons, keep an eye out for that. Let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. Martin wrote in saying regarding the email about the storage on the new Xboxes. Disk based games are also fully installed to the hard drive. After installed, the disk is essentially only used as a license to play the game. This is also true for PS4, PS5, and Xbox Ones. You can even use the Xbox mobile app to download the game to the Xbox without purchasing the digital version and then insert the disk to start the game. For clarity, the disk needs to be inserted the whole time you're playing, but the game itself is not read from the disk other than if you install it from the disk. Therefore, the amount of storage a player would want would be the same whether they have the digital or physical version of the console. And in either case, Microsoft will be happy to sell you a memory card for additional storage. Uh, thank you, Martin. Mike in Dubai also wrote in with a, a similar email. Uh, and and you're right. And I and I know Nate knew that uh, when he wrote his question. Uh, but it, it still sort of leaves open uh, the question of, okay, that that's fine. Martin, you said it yourself. Uh, you will Your need for storage would be the same. So why give double the storage to the one that has the disk slot in it? Scott, could you could you shed any light on that? Well, I watched the the event very carefully and what was considered overall like one of Microsoft's best presentations. This was the head scratcher for me because I don't think it makes any sense to release a diskless version and a disked version giving the disk more space. They may think that makes it seem like more of a premium buy. I guess so. That's probably why they did it. But I also have a cons not a conspiracy theory. I have a theory that they really would like to sell expansions, and those those expansion yeah. keys that they sell are very cool. They're very fast. They support MVNE. They do all the performance stuff you need those things to do. But they're kind of expensive, and they're a great add-on if Microsoft can sell more. So I'm not saying that's exactly the reason they're doing it. But if you buy the diskless one, 
just be prepared to feel like maybe you want to use one of those or buy one of those too. Interesting. We'll see. Uh, also, Xander wrote in uh, with a reason why they're excited for Apple's call transcription feature coming to iOS 18. Much like the recent video conferencing AIs that can pull meeting notes and action items after the call is done, this could be used to help project manage your personal life. Uh, imagine taking a call from your doctor and being able to focus on the conversation and not having to split your attention to take notes. Afterward, you ask Siri to create an outline of the conversation with a summary, and you could even decipher future appointments to put on your calendar. Nice. I like it. Well, thanks to everybody who writes us. Uh, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send thoughts, questions, and anything else. Thanks to you, Scott Johnson, for being with us today. Let folks know, uh, what is your latest? Well, uh, our show, Core, which happens at frogpants.com slash core, happens every Thursday. It's a podcast as well as a live stream and a YouTube archive. That show is about to get crazy this week because we had a lot happen since we talked last. We had the Summer Fest Games event from Jeff Keeley. We had Microsoft's big event, Ubisoft Forward, and oh, PC Game Show. Like A bunch of stuff went down, and we learned a bunch of new things, and a lot of it seems very cool. Everyone wants to talk about how the industry's in a bit of a dip, but based on some of these presentations, there is still some really rad stuff coming our way as gamers. So check it out. That's on Thursdays. Get the podcast wherever you get them or head on over to frogpants.com slash core. Patrons, stick around for the extended show. Good day, Internet. The conversation goes on. Sarah is going to cover all the things Apple Sherlocked this week and explain what Sherlocked is. Yeah, uh, but uh, just a reminder, we do the show live Monday through Friday. You can catch it live at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We'll be back again doing it all tomorrow with Justin Robert Young joining us. We'll talk to you then. The DTNS family of podcasts, helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>